Uh, the last talk of this session is about the uh, ISOPS with the uh, untrusted CRS uh, security in the face of parameter subversion. Isha Berare, uh, York Fishberger, and uh, Alessandra Scafro. And the uh, speaker is uh, York. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, welcome to the last talk of a very long day. So in uh, this work, we look at um, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, and uh, we look at what can be said if the CRS cannot be trusted. So the motivation of this work is that uh, one of the things that the Snowden revelations showed was that the security agencies are trying to subvert uh, parameters of cryptographic schemes. And uh, usually the way we model schemes is that we trust these parameters. So um, the uh, example that was already mentioned this morning is the uh, dual EC uh, random number generator uh, designed by the NSA, where um, there are some uh, parameters, namely two elliptic curve points P and Q, which is supposed to be trusted. And uh, however, it's been shown that if someone knows the uh, logarithm of one uh, point with respect to the other one, and you can actually predict uh, the output of the RNG. And um, later Chekhov showed that this can actually be used to break uh, TLS. So what we look at is a different uh, cryptographic primitive, namely non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, which is uh, a central primitive that inherently depends on trusted parameters because they need uh, this uh, common reference string and it's supposed to be uh, set up in a trusted way. And uh, a recent example um, was um, a new anonymous cryptocurrency called Zcash, which actually uses zero-knowledge SNARKs, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether these uh, parameters have been set up in a trusted way and whether one should trust um, the parameters. <coughs> so, um, related work, there's... Um, uh, the, the work that's most related is probably two move uh, zero knowledge um, protocols. There's also been a lot of work um, in trying to distribute the trust needed to set up these, um, the CRS by using secure multi-party computation. And um, the subversion side of our work, there's uh, also been a, a lot of work, and we saw one example this morning, namely about uh, cryptography. Okay, so uh, let's look at the, the setting we're looking at. Um, so we, we consider non-interactive proofs, so what are these? Um, suppose we've got a language, um, where is the, a language L and then P language, and we want to prove that some statement is in the language. There's a proofer and a verifier, and the proofer has, in addition to the statement, has a witness W, and using this witness, he computes a proof, sends it to the verifier who either accepts or rejects. And um, we suppose that we have this uh, common reference string here that is accessible by both of them and that has been set up in a trusted way. So the, the classical properties that we want from um, a proof system is soundness, which means that uh, no adversary can convince the verifier of a wrong proof, so meaning that if the proof uh, is accepted, then the statement should be in the language. And there's also notions that protect uh, the proof from malicious verifiers. In particular, we want to um, protect the witness that is used by the proofer. And uh, uh, a weaker notion is a witness indistinguishability, which asks that proofs computed using different witnesses should be indistinguishable. Now, uh, as the a stronger notion is zero knowledge, which uh, formalizes the fact that nothing should be leaked about the witness. And this is formalized by requiring that there be a simulator that uh, can compute its own uh, CRS and uh, using a trap that can simulate proofs without having access to the witness. And we say that the proof system is zero knowledge if these two worlds, so the real world and the simulated world, are indistinguishable. Okay, so what we did is uh, we consider now notions where uh, this CRS is not uh, trusted. 
So for example, we consider subversion soundness, where again, the uh, adversary's task is to compute the proof um, the of a wrong statement. But we now let the adversary choose the CRS. So subversion soundness again means even if the adversary chooses the CRS, if a proof verifies, then the statement is true. Um, Conversely, we, we consider subversion witness indistinguishability, where now the adversary again outputs the CRS, and if the prover uses this CRS to, to uh, compute proofs, again the proofs should be uh, should be indistinguishable which witness was used. And finally, the third notion we introduce is subversion zero knowledge. So this uh, was the uh, the classical definition, so simulated world, real world. But now we want to consider an adversarially generated CRS. So suppose we have uh, um, a CRS subverter that is some algorithm that takes input random points and outputs a CRS. Then what we want is that we should uh, be able to simulate the view of this uh, subverter. So in particular we want that our simulator can not only create a uh, simulated CRS but the full view including the coins uh, that were used by the CRS subverter. So again, if these two worlds are indistinguishable, then we say that our scheme is subversion zero knowledge. So uh, just to be more precise, uh, we want that for any CRS subverter, there exists a simulator that um, outputs a CRS and coins that are indistinguishable from the ones output by the subverter, and in addition, uh, simulates proofs. So it means that for the adversary, it's indistinguishable whether it's given a real proof oracle or an oracle that simulates proofs. And then we say a scheme is subversion zero knowledge. So these are our results. Um, we have six notions, the classical ones, soundness, zero knowledge, and witness indistinguishability. We have our three uh, new notions, subversion soundness, subversion zero knowledge, subversion witness indistinguishability. And we show that the subversion versions imply the original versions, and any zero knowledge version implies witness indistinguishability. Okay, it's not very exciting, so we have uh, more results. In particular, so we have defined three new versions um, that are subversion resistant, and what we actually do is we analyze what can be achieved and under which assumptions can we achieve it. So uh, first, some trivial results. If we want subversion zero knowledge, then we could just define proofs as being the empty string. They have at the verifier always accepting. That's subversion zero knowledge, but it's not sound, so it's not very interesting. Also, we could have soundness, even subversion soundness, by just sending the witness and the verifier checking uh, himself, but that wouldn't be zero knowledge. So that's not really interesting. In particular, what we have is there are schemes that satisfy the classical notions and what we're really interested is in is uh, to see if these schemes can be upgraded to, in addition, give uh, subversion resistant security. So I want to see that which of these uh, properties can be achieved. And um, I'll start with the bad news. And the bad news is that if um, we want zero knowledge, then we cannot have subversion soundness. So subversion soundness means that if, um, if we want to break it, then we should construct an adversary outputting a CRS and a proof that verifies for uh, a false statement. So how can this be done? Well, basically it's because um, zero knowledge guarantees that there's a simulator that can simulate proofs. And unless the language is trivial, um, we can just use the simulator and simulate a proof for a wrong statement. So we see that there's two goals that are incompatible. So the next question we ask is, um, can something be achieved? Uh, for example, if, um, if we really want uh, subversion soundness, then we know we can't have zero knowledge. We cannot have sub subversion zero knowledge either, of course. But can we have, for example, subversion witness indistinguishability? So that would be the best possible notions, including subversion soundness. And it turns out this can be done, and 
there is actually there is a scheme that achieves that, and it's a non-interactive ZAPS, which is um, a non-interactive witness indistinguishable proof system that doesn't have a CRS. So if there's no CRS, then there's no way to subvert it. So the, um, the standard notions imply the subversion resistant notion, and Grothostrovsky and Sahai actually construct such a scheme under a standard assumption. They prove that it's witness indistinguishable under decision linear assumption. So that's good. So we saw that this can be achieved, but what if we want to have zero knowledge? In particular, what if we want to have subversion zero knowledge? So we know that um, since we subversion zero knowledge implies zero knowledge, so we can't have subversion soundness, but can we have everything else except that? Um, the thing is that if we have subversion zero knowledge, then we basically have um, a security. We can protect the prover even if the verifier generates the CRS. So that implies um, certain kinds of two move zero knowledge because we can just let the verifier choose the CRS. And we know that these can only be achieved under extractability assumptions, like for example, extractable one-way functions in the work by Vitansky et al. And so it's very unlikely that uh, we can achieve subversion resist uh, subversion zero knowledge uh, secure schemes under falsifiable assumptions. And what we what we uh, construct is actually uh, uh, something that's secure under a uh, new knowledge of exponent assumption that we introduce. So this is our goal. If we want to have uh, subversion zero knowledge, then for any CRS subverter, we need to construct a simulator that simulates the CRS and the coins used by the subverter and who can simulate proofs. So uh, let's look at uh, knowledge of exponent assumptions. The uh, classical version states that for any algorithm that is given two random group elements G and H and that outputs a pair of this form G to the S, H to the S, then actually um, the algorithm must know S. So what does it mean to know S? This is formalized by requiring that there be a simulator, uh, sorry, an extractor that extracts S. Okay, so we have this assumption guarantees that uh, if an algorithm outputs something, then we can extract something that's somehow hidden inside. And that's kind of the idea that we use for um, constructing subversion zero knowledge. Namely, we define um, CRS is to be of this form and we know that we can extract this uh, element S and we use that as our trapdoor. How does this S allow us to simulate proofs? Well, we simply prove statements of the form either the uh, X is in the language or I know some S. And now since the, the simulator can extract the S, it can, sim it can simulate proofs. What do we use for these proofs? Well, we use ZAPs again because we only need witness indistinguishability in order to ensure that simulated proofs and real proofs are indistinguishable. And moreover, we don't need an extra CRS. Okay, so it's a nice idea, but uh, it doesn't work because the problem is who chooses this element H? So this uh, knowledge of exponent assumption only guarantees that if um, the algorithm gets these two random group elements and produces such a structured output, then we can extract S. But now we need to construct um, or define a CRS that's completely simulated by the simulator and in particular, by, by, sorry, by the CRS subverter. And in particular, if we let the subverter choose H, then uh, this is not true anymore because a, uh, the subverter could just pick a random element here and knowing the logarithm of H could produce this element without knowing S. So what we do is we argue that that's actually the only way that um, the algorithm could construct such a, such a structured output. And we introduce a new kind of knowledge of exponent assumption that states that if an algorithm outputs G to the S, H to the S, and H, then either he must know S or he must know the logarithm of H. So there exists a, an extractor that uh, extracts one of the two logarithm of this uh, Diffie-Hellman triple, hence the name THKEA. And now we adapt our proof stating that um, either the statement is true 
or I know S, or I know the logarithm of H. And again, whatever can be extracted here then allows us to simulate. So there's another technicality that we have to overcome, which is how do we actually um, realize this proof of knowledge? So if, uh, if it was um, traditional uh, non-interactive zero knowledge, then a way to do it is uh, include in the proof an encryption of whatever I prove knowledge of, so include an encryption of S. But the question is, under what public key do we encrypt this? So if, if we only needed zero knowledge, we could just uh, include this public key in the CRS, and then when we prove in the reduction for soundness, the, the reduction would know the secret key and it could decrypt, and we could extract and, and the proof would work. But since we want uh, subversion zero knowledge, then that's actually not possible because if the public key under which the trapdoor is encrypted is in the CRS, then if the adversary created that CRS, it could distinguish simulated from real proofs by simply decrypting whatever the uh, challenger encrypted and then check whether it was a simulated proof or not. So that's not possible. So where else can we put the public key? Uh, we could put it in the proof. But that also seems to not make sense because in the soundness game, it's uh, the adversary that constructs a wrong proof. And if it's the adversary that adds an encryption under a key that he computed himself, then how should we extract? So to get around this, we actually will use the knowledge of exponent assumption again and add um, a proof of the secret key that can then in the reduction um, so the secret key can then be extracted using the knowledge of exponent assumption and we can thereby prove soundness. So that leads to um, the third line here. So we show that we can achieve all possible um, notions except uh, subversion soundness, which is incompatible with zero knowledge, as I said, under a strong assumption. And I said that this is kind of what we expect because uh, it implies to move zero knowledge. So what if we, we're not happy with strong assumptions? Can we do something, can we at least have some subversion resistance uh, without resorting to strong assumptions? And that's um, the third, fourth actually, uh, result that we show, which is that if we're happy with having a regular NISIC and in addition, uh, we want subversion witness indistinguishability, then this can be achieved without assuming anything else. So there's no extra assumptions needed for that. And that concludes my talk. Any questions? Sorry, so you needed the, um, the approval to prove that it knows the secret key for the public key, right? Um, so you mean this, right? Yeah, the KEA proof. So basically, um, if we look at our knowledge of exponent assumption again, then basically what we do is we have, so S would be the secret key, and we, so actually since we don't know um, whether we're gonna extract S or ether, what we do is we actually have two ciphertexts and then combine the um, secret key so that we're sure that uh, one of the two um, secret keys we can extract. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, so it's a linear encryption, so there's two uh, exponents and what we do is actually we, so, so this, this here would have both exponents, so we combine all possible combinations and we know that uh, if we extract from all four, then there must be at least, well, it's technical, but you, you can show that uh, you can extract by having more than one encryption. Yeah. Any other question? Oh, time to speak again. And thank so thanks all speakers again. Any announcements?
I need to announce. Okay. Uh, so there, uh, there is a ISR meeting uh, on just after here. Okay. Okay. Right. Right now. Hello. The ISR membership meeting will start right here in this room in uh, two or three minutes. Yeah. <laughs>